when I said in the House of Commons the other day that I thought it improbable that the enemy's air attack in September could be more than three times as great as it was in August, I was not, of course, referring to barbarous attacks upon the civil population but to the great air battle which is being fought out between our fighters and the German air force. You will understand that whenever the weather is favorable, waves of German bombers protected by fighters, often three or four hundred at a time, surge over this island, especially the promontory of Kent, in the hopes of attacking military and other objectives by daylight. However, they are met by our fighter squadrons and nearly always broken up, and their losses average three to one in machines and six to one in pilots. This effort of the Germans to secure daylight mastery of the air over England is, of course, the crux of the whole war. So far, it has failed conspicuously. It has cost them very dear, and we have felt stronger, and are actually and relatively a good deal stronger than when the hard fighting began in July. There is no doubt that Herr Hitler is using up his fighter force at a very high rate, and that if he goes on for many more weeks, he will wear down and ruin this vital part of his air force. That will give us a very great advantage. On the other hand, for him to try to invade this country without having secured mastery in the air would be a very hazardous undertaking. Nevertheless, all his preparations for invasion on a great scale are steadily going forward. Several hundreds of self-propelled barges are moving down the coasts of Europe from the German and Dutch harbors to the ports of northern France, from Dunkirk to Brest, and beyond Brest to the harbors, the French harbors in the Bay of Biscay. Besides this, Convoys of merchant ships in tens and dozens are being moved through the Straits of Dover into the channel, dodging along from port to port under the protection of the new batteries which the Germans have built on the French shore. There are now considerable gatherings of shipping in the German, Dutch, Belgian and French harbors all the way from Hamburg to Brest. Finally, there are some preparations made of ships to carry an invading force from the Norwegian harbor. Behind these clusters of ships or barges, there stand very large numbers of German troops awaiting the order to go on board and set out on their very dangerous and uncertain voyage across the sea. We cannot tell when they will try to come. We cannot be sure that in fact they will try at all. But no one should blind himself to the fact that a heavy full-scale invasion of this island is being prepared with all the usual German thoroughness and method, and that it may be launched at any time now upon England, upon Scotland, 
or upon Ireland, or upon all three. Uh, if this invasion is going to be tried at all, it does not seem that it can be long delayed. The weather may break at any time. Besides this, it is difficult for the enemy to keep these gatherings of ships waiting about indefinitely while they are bombed every night by our bombers and very often shelled by our warships which are waiting for them outside. Therefore we must regard the next week or so as a very important week for us in our history. It ranks with the days when the Spanish Armada was approaching the channel and Drake was finishing his game of bowls. Or when Nelson stood between us and Napoleon's grand army at Boulogne. We've read about all this in the history books. But what is happening now is on a far greater scale and a far more consequence to the life and future of the world and its civilization than these brave old days of the past. Every man and woman will therefore prepare himself to do his duty, whatever it may be, with special pride and care. Our fleets and flotillas are very powerful and numerous. Our air force is at the highest strength it has ever reached. And it is conscious of its proved superiority, not indeed in numbers, but in men and machines. Our shores are well fortified and strongly manned. And behind them, ready to attack the invaders, we have a far larger and better equipped mobile army than we have ever had before. Besides this, we have more than a million and a half men of the Home Guard who are just as much soldiers of the regular army in status as the Grenadier Guards and who are determined to fight for every inch of the ground in every village and in every street. It is with devout but sure confidence that I say, let God defend the right. These cruel, wanton, indiscriminate bombings of London are, of course, a part of Hitler's invasion plan. He hopes by killing large numbers of civilians and women and children that he will terrorize and cow the people of this mighty imperial city and make them a burden and anxiety to the government and thus distract our attention unduly from the ferocious onslaught he is preparing. Little does he know the spirit of the British nation or the tough fibre of the Londoner whose forebears played a leading part in the establishment of parliamentary institutions and who have been bred to value freedom far above their lives. This wicked man the repository and embodiment of many forms of soul-destroying hatreds, this monstrous product of former wrongs and shame, has now resolved to try to break our famous island race by a process of indiscriminate slaughter and destruction. What he has done is to kindle a fire in British hearts here and all over the world, which will glow long after all traces of the conflagration he has caused in London have been removed. He has lighted a fire which will burn with a steady and consuming flame until the last vestiges of Nazi tyranny have been burnt out of Europe and until the old world and the new can join hands to rebuild the temples of man's freedom and man's honor upon foundations which will not 
soon or easily be overthrown. This is a time for everyone to stand together and hold firm as they are doing. I express my admiration for the exemplary manner in which all the air raid precaution services of London are being discharged, especially the fire brigades whose work has been so heavy and uh, also dangerous. All the world that is still free marvels at the composure and fortitude with which the citizens of London are facing and surmounting the great ordeal to which they are subjected, the end of which or the severity of which cannot yet be foreseen. It is a message of good cheer to our fighting forces on the seas, in the air and in our waiting armies, in all their posts, and stations that we send them from this capital city. They know that they have behind them a people who will not flinch or weary of the struggle, hard and protracted as though it will be, but that we shall rather draw from the heart of suffering itself the means of inspiration and survival and of a victory won not only for ourselves but for all. A victory won not only for our own times but for the long and better days that are to come.